Welcome to Open Door Philosophy. I'm Taylor Jones. And I'm Andrew. Oh, with one name. I'm Derek Parsons. Hi, guys. And welcome to episode 70, where we will be talking about enlightenment political philosophy. But first, how are you guys? Oh, Andrew, I feel wow. it's you today. You go um, I'm doing well. I'm just uh, enjoying this nice, crisp fall air. Mm-hmm. And yeah, riding off the Astros coattail. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and that's about it. Nothing too exciting. Nothing too exciting other than that. Mm. What about y'all? Yeah. Great. Well, I'll go next because Taylor introduced us. Um, I am doing great. Uh, I'm also enjoying the fall weather. Um, because yeah, it's like three weeks was ago. Hell. So anyway, <laughs> we don't want to go back yeah. there again. Uh, yeah, so I'm enjoying the cool weather. Yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah, summer lasts forever in Houston. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't have anything to report. I, I just got back from, well, not back, wow. but I uh, had fall break, so I enjoyed that quite a lot. Um, and uh, once again, I have no essays to grade this weekend, so yay me. I will next weekend. And so I'm just enjoying it, enjoying life. It's all great. It's all great. Need a haircut to d- tomorrow. How are you, Taylor? I'm good. Speaking of haircuts, I just got one, which I was very excited about. Chopped some length off. Got it dyed. Look fab. Thank you. Um, I also yeah. just had my fall break and I had a week back at school, um, middle of the semester drag, just trying to chug along to Thanksgiving. Yeah. And also enjoying the fall weather, but it's supposed to get up to 90 today. So we'll have like our couple warm weeks before we get back to the cold of Halloween. Yeah. 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 Oh, wait, I have a silly story to tell. <gasps> Let's hear it. So last week on a, on a Wednesday bears or whatever oh. animal we decided to choose at build a bear uh and we call them philosopher bears and we named them after philo- our favorite philosophers so it's a totally silly thing but it was an awful lot of fun <laughs> i have to admit and uh, my my bear's name is emerson That's so <laughs> did you have any like really weird ones did anyone pick nietzsche no there was a kierkegaard one one name uh one named hers uh Lao Tzu. um so yeah we had, we had a good time it was a lot of fun yeah. It was very silly. Mm. Very silly. We all went out to dinner That's afterwards. Fun. So, so it was fun. It's so yeah. fun. Aw. I love the antics of HL philosophy. That one's like just such a It's just so class. fun because you like you know each other for two two straight years mm-hmm. and, and you get to be like a yeah. close little group and you do silly things together like that. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it's good times. Good for old Parsons Heart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So fun. Yeah. That's that sounds mm-hmm. fun. You should we should <laughs> upload a picture of your bear too somewhere. Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. All those glasses broke. Of oh, course, no. Yeah, glasses. I, I know. I no. mean, I normally have glasses, but because I'm old uh, and together. the computer's this close, I take off my glasses to see because um, <laughs> <laughs> now we have video, so it matters. But uh, yeah, his little glasses broke. I have to go back to the mall, which is the, my least favorite thing to do. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll get a picture of, of Emerson. He has a shirt that has bo- yeah, a stack of books on it and says, my weekend is booked. <laughs> get it? That's funny. I'm put my glasses on for the viewers. All right, there we go. Yeah. Now I can't see you guys. I have to there do this. Are. I've actually forgot you because I see you so much in front of the computer now. I forgot that you have glasses. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Do we all have glasses? Uh, yeah, you have glasses, Taylor. And mm-hmm. yeah. have glasses, don't you? I have, have glasses. Gl- I wear contacts. contacts right? I'm a big contact mm-hmm. guy. I wish I have yeah. a glasses episode. <laughs> Yeah, I want to get new glasses. My my glasses that I have are from 2014, 2013. So I need to get new ones. Uh, they're way out of style. They make me look like I'm... Are they even like an accurate prescription? No. How can you see? No, absolutely. It's like 10 years I mean, ago. I can see barely, but uh, they don't look good. They're like about 10 years prescription old. Luckily, my eyes haven't changed that much, but I think I'm going to get some wireframe glasses next to fall into the look. You know? mm, yeah. Like the right. the like circle ones? Yeah. Like Milo from Atlantis? I don't know who that is. My, uh, my first <laughs> my first pair of glasses were wire wire circle glasses. That mm. was like back in, in the mid-80s. It's the look. I'll get the mullet my dad's and, the, and the wireframe glasses. Yeah. You just become a, a little me, you know, a mini me, you know. Like you just, <laughs> all, all, all things come around, you know. All things, it's all, it's all circular. Anyway, Taylor, you seemed offended that Andrew didn't know somebody. Who, who are we talking about? Milo from Atlantis, the Disney movie. 
Oh, the Disney movie. That was one of the few movies. I know who that person, that character is. It's one of the few Disney movies I'm not totally up on. Yeah, I don't know that I've ever yeah, I don't know seen it, maybe once. In fact, I'm wearing a, uh, a tramp shirt right now. <gasps> That's the one you have matching with Special K, right? Uh, she has Lady, yeah. Aww. Anyway, we're, uh, you know, just to, because we're avoiding talking about stuff that's nasty, brutish, and short, you know, after this, uh, we're going to something called uh, Pups and Pints. So it's a local brewery <gasps> having a, a dog day. So we're wearing our <laughs> Disney dog shirts. Can we move on? <laughs> dog, that is so cute. Couple yeah. goals. We'll take Alfred. It'll be great. <laughs> it's a beautiful day for mm-hmm. it. So anyway. It is. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, let's talk about some social and political philosophy, I guess, from the Enlightenment. It's mm-hmm. mm-hmm. a big change. It is a big, a big shift. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll say my disclaimer right up front. Uh, this is not my area. I, I, I t- so the, the only way I'm familiar with these guys uh, and their theories. I mean, I know Locke from like other things like human nature, but uh, Rousseau and Hobbes, I, I know back when I taught history, I, I know them because I used to teach the Enlightenment as a historical movement. So I know there are theories about that, but only enough to be dangerous. So it'll be really interesting to hear what you guys have to say about them today. Yeah, yeah and I'll, I'll say a little disclaimer too. My, I mean, I'm quite familiar with a few of these people that we're going to talk about today, but uh, that really begins and ends with their moral, moral psychology elements. And that's concerned with what do they think humans uh, are like? How are humans natural into the world? And uh, how do they operate with each other outside the confines of society? That's something that really interests me. So that's how I'm more familiar with these philosophers. Uh, And I think that Taylor has the Mm -hmm. more political side of that. So I think it'll be an interesting episode. Yeah, Yeah. I studied them more in like the political philosophy context. So that's kind of where my knowledge comes from, like how they would build a society or like what rights we are born with and what's given by like a state government. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my familiarity too, mm-hmm. although not to the depth of view. Right. So it's about like what the state, you know, man is born into the state mm-hmm. of nature and uh, all three of these guys have different views on exactly what that nature is. And then of course, you know, we get into things like natural rights with John Locke and all that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's going to be good. Yeah, it should be yeah. good. So how do, how do we want to start this? Do we want to talk about the, how about we uh, talk a little bit about the context of the time? Yeah. Going into and the let's introduce who we're talking about today. Oh, I don't know if we've even yeah. done that. Um, yeah. We kind of mentioned them, but yeah. So who are we talking about today, guys? We are talking about Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau today. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so this, this will be, I think, uh, I really like especially one of these guys, and I really don't like one of these guys. Oh. Uh, and so, Yeah. You'll have to keep mm. listening to see who, maybe, maybe, it, well, I'm sure you'll know, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about these yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, well, so how about that historical context, Yeah. like what's going on? Where are these guys writing? Well, we're going to, we're covering kind of a large amount of time with these three philosophers. Mm-hmm. We are. We're starting with, Tom, with Thomas Hobbes, who was born in the 1500s, late 1500s. He was born in 1588 in England. And I mean, he has a pretty chaotic life, but I mean, that, that time period, it's like post Renaissance, but I wouldn't say post enlightenment mm-hmm. or not post enlightenment. I wouldn't say that's necessarily the enlightenment yeah. yet. Yeah. And then, very early enlightenment. If, if you consider yeah, it at all. I think usually yeah, about I th- 1650, sorry to cut you off. is kind of like the start no. of the enlightenment era. Mm-hmm. But I would say yeah. he influenced English enlightenment mm-hmm. thinkers. Yeah. Definitely. It was kind of connected in that way. Definitely. And I think, although I'm not quite sure, I would, I mean, when we think about Renaissance, that's like 1480s in Italy, Mm -hmm. but those ideas take a long time to disseminate into the rest of Western Europe. So I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know too much about England and the Renaissance, but I know that they had something occur. And I'm sure that around the time that he was probably at least being born, those ideas were, I mean, actually, I'm 100% sure because we're, we can talk about his upbringing in the classics in a second. So well, let me interject. That, yeah, yeah, let me interject there too. When, when historically speaking, depending on this, uh, I guess the author you're reading, uh, they identify uh, Renaissance by a couple of different areas. Uh, so you have the Italian Renaissance, which was first and where it began. And then you have some sort of broad 
category called the Northern Renaissance. And that happens kind of in different times, like you mentioned in Northern Europe. For England, if if people are familiar with the Shakespearean era, um, and a little bit before then, so Elizabethan England um, is, is kind of like Renaissance era for but boy, it looked very different than, than say, the Italian Renaissance. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, definitely, definitely. Um, and I'm even, well, when when was the uh, Shakespearean Renaissance? Do you know around what time that was? Well, okay. It's been a long time since I've looked at it. Uh, <laughs> Elizabeth Tudor um, was, or, uh, hey, yeah, Elizabeth, yeah. She was, I'm ballparking here, 1550 to 1600. Okay. And then uh, after that was the Stuart dynasty yes. and that was James the mm-hmm. first. And he's, uh, he's the one that uh, Shakespeare. So Shakespeare was writing during Elizabeth and James the first reign. Mm-hmm. It was under James the first that the globe theater is burnt down because uh, he allowed those zealots, not actual zealots. That's a term. <laughs> that's, that's an actual <laughs> term too. Uh, those zealots, the Puritans, you know, do, do their thing and burning the globe theater was one of them. So it's kind of like in that uh, 1500 to six, 1550 to 1650, we can just very broadly say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that would have been kind of in that, maybe some upbringing for him or at least in the background. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hobbes, for sure. Uh, and a lot yeah. of other crazy things. We'll talk about him in a second. And then we're going to go to mm-hmm. John Locke and he's uh, 1630s to 1704. So we're jumping. I mean, that has a little bit of Hobbes in his life, but we're jumping to the 1700s. Mm-hmm. And then John Jacques Rousseau, he's, I mean, much later than Hobbes uh, going into definitely the Enlightenment period, uh, 1712 to 1778. And he's, mm-hmm. he has massive, I mean, he's very commonly known as being a uh, very important philosophical figure for American Revolution, and and I think mm-hmm. that's like where he's most commonly known, along with Locke. Yeah, yeah, and we should probably talk about for listeners like what exactly the Enlightenment is. That's a term that we throw around a lot. I, I will say, it's, uh, it, like, I always think of it in terms of context, though, of how it coincides with the American Revolution. And I don't want to be too much of a history teacher here for a minute, but obviously, I was 1776. Mm-hmm. Well, the war lasted until uh, 1782, I think. But anyway, uh, of course, all the American leaders, uh, Washington, Jefferson, Adams, all of them were uh, were reading Enlightenment thinkers, right? And it was really a product of the Enlightenment. And so when you look at these Enlightenment writers over in Europe, such as John Locke, he was an earlier writer, died in 1704, I think you said. But then some of your later Enlightenment thinkers, a lot of them were French. So Montesquieu, Mm -hmm. Voltaire, um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, all of the American leaders who were involved in the American Revolution read these people, read these guys. And so 1776 is kind of a pivotal, like you kind of see it all leading up to what happened there. And then once the American Revolution happens, I think it's 12 years later, by extension, the French Revolution happens, Mm -hmm. which is no surprise because a lot of of Enlightenment thinkers were French. So anyway, there's your historical context for it. So uh, how would we, like if you're you're just talking with someone, you know, having coffee Mm -hmm. and they're like, hey, what's the Enlightenment? I hear a lot about that. But what what would you guys say to that? How would you explain it to them? Mm -hmm. The way that I think about the Enlightenment is it's a philosophical and scientific revolution against the Aristotelianism of the time. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so I think there's a little bit more emphasis on reasoning outside of uh, first principles from God. Um, mm-hmm. And I would also mm-hmm. say that um, not only in, I think it's more commonly thought about in science and maybe in political philosophy too, but there's also a stark rejection of previously held understandings of what humans were uh, and, mm-hmm. and human um, human nature. If we're not starting with what the church necessarily tells us is true for human nature, then we need to reason our way up. And so if we're observing the natural world around us, which is a key enlightenment idea, mm-hmm. uh, then we are going to be making different observations about human nature. And that really feeds into a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. I think Andrew did a great job. Thanks. Yeah, I think some of the big takeaways are that the Enlightenment kills Aristotle in kind of a general way. Like they reject Aristotelian physics and the church had hung on to Aristotle. And so all these thinkers were pushing against that and also trying to reconcile a mechanistic worldview with the like persisting idea of a god, whether that's a theistic god Mm -hmm. or the rise of like a deistic god 
where you get like the watchmaker God analogy where there was a divine creator that made the universe or made the world and set it into motion, but's not actively involved in that. And that kind of changes how thinkers see the human self and like metaphysics starts to rise out of that. The changes of like the human doing things rationally versus because it was a divine ordinance. Yeah, and this emphasis on logic and rationalism, mm-hmm. uh, empiricism, you know, is, is you know a spinoff. I don't know if it's a spinoff. Maybe they write, or, uh, kind of coincide. But anyway, the scientific revolution, mm-hmm. which is a super broad category, uh, you know, is also kind of linked with this enlightenment thinking, and then by extension, of course, uh, political thought yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. So it's all it's all intermingled, and frankly, it's just a big paradigm shift in Western thinking. Yeah. Yep, mm-hmm. yep, and it has a, a lot of implications in uh, Western thought until. I mean, until now, uh, and mm-hmm. I would even see, oh, yeah, I still even argue it's still to going today. on. And I think in the past, uh, maybe in the past hundred years, there's been a, I mean, there, there's always been kind of movements against, uh, the enlightenment in some way. Mm-hmm. I mean, the romantic movement mm-hmm. is what I'm thinking of romanticism, mm-hmm. but I would say in mm-hmm. philosophy Absolutely. in the past, I mean, that was probably in literature and the arts uh, mm-hmm. revolution against mm-hmm. that. But I think in philosophy in the past hundred or so years, uh, probably with the end of logical positive positivism, there's been a little bit of a backing away from um, some of the enlightenment thought, but I still think mm-hmm. by and large, it's the most, most influential piece of philosophy or philosophical movement that's still even still ongoing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. One of my professors likes to say that we are so entrenched in Descartes' world that we don't even know it. That like mm-hmm. these very early modern Enlightenment thinkers changed how people fundamentally see the world so much that we can't separate ourselves from that enough to even imagine what it would have been like before them. Yeah, would have been better. No, I don't know. <laughs> well, let's get on to our first guy, our boy, our boy Thomas Hobbes. This is where I dip out. I don't know a whole lot. Well, this so. is one of my favorite guys. Uh, this mm-hmm. is one of my favorite people in all of philosophy. And it's just because he's so <laughs> he's so mean and he's so depressing. And that's why I love him. Mm-hmm. Everyone should pull up the nice picture by John Michael Wright to look at him. He's an old man in the picture about 10 years before he dies. But mm. I think that's a good image to have in his mind. Thomas Hobbes, he's an Englishman, uh, like we said, late, basically in the 1600s. He grew up a little bit in the 1500s, but uh, pr- uh, predominantly, I mean, was formed in the 1600s. He was born in 1588. But uh, during that time, I mean, if, even from the womb, he was he was born out of fear. Uh, he was. Mm-hmm. It said. I mean, he said that he was born prematurely when his mom found out that the Spanish Armada was invading England, uh, and so oh, wow. he wrote. Uh, let me look at my notes real quick. He wrote that my mother gave birth to twins, myself in fear, <laughs> and uh, and so I think that's just. Yeah, uh, it's just so mm-hmm. fun, so funny, because that's, I think, I mean, I, that's a big part of his his philosophy, for sure. Mm-hmm. He was born to yeah. somewhat of a rich family, uh, and, and that's not that important. The only important bit of that is that he had some kind of education in the classics. Erasmus, mm-hmm. who was a big Enlightenment figure in the North, he, he popularized the study of Greek and Latin, and so... Uh, what happens then is that a lot of young intellectuals start studying this. And he is very smart. And we can see first, we can see his first kind of work into philosophy. He translates Euripides' Medea, which is an mm. awful, awful play about <gasps> uh, a mother and mother killing her two children. And so that's one of his first translation works. He He, he translated it from... Greek into Latin. He works in Latin. And then he made the first English translation of uh, Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War. Um, mm, yeah, okay. I read that. Yeah. Sometime in the... Well, I haven't read the Peloponnesian War. I read that he tra- <laughs> <laughs> translated it. Yeah. Like the read, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so he translated that in 1628. 
And so, mm-hmm. so that's when he's uh, a young student. He was so, so, so um, interested in uh, Greek and Latin, you know, Latin work. He wrote in Latin as well. So, so mm. he's, I mean, this is a big backdrop for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think that's yeah. really interesting. I think the next part of his biography is essential into understanding him. Uh, around the 1630s, he moved to Paris to be a tutor. And so this is where he's getting a lot of these Renaissance ideas and got a lot of his cultural and enlightenment, pre-enlightenment, maybe Renaissance thoughts that he was thinking about. So he was mm-hmm. spending time in Paris in the probably early salons. But we know for a fact that he was uh, meeting with all of the great intellectuals of the time. He visited Galileo in Florence in 16, hmm. 1636 when Galileo was in house address and he was leading these. Huh, I didn't know that. Super cool. He was leading these um, debate groups essentially with the best mm-hmm. philosophers in Paris of the time. So we can really see that huh. he's engaging with these great philosophers. And he, what's cool, I think, about Hobbes is he's not necessarily interested in political philosophy yet. He's not necessarily staying in the Greek and Latin world, although that was mm-hmm. so much of his formation. What he's interested in is physics and momentum and the natural world, oh. so much like these huh. early Enlightenment thinkers. And what his idea was is that he was going to spend his entire life coming within, coming up with an idea or theory of motion in physics. And then really it's not like he wanted to study like how ships move in the ocean or how, uh, you know, alarms in the clock towers move. That's not the motion he was interested in. He was interested in uh, the motion, the action, mechanical action of uh, human beings. And so that's what he was studying. That's his earliest study Mm. of man. And then, and this is how he gets kind of kickstarted, how he starts studying. He realizes that he can only study men on how they move in society. Mm. Mm. And he he was interested in, <laughs> well, one of his concerns, I think, was how do we prevent men from leaving society? How do we keep humankind, mankind moving forward? Yeah, I was going to actually ask for clarification there when you say men, uh, you mankind, mean mankind, right? Mankind, yep, yeah. mankind. So he's interested in like the metaphysical and the physical here. And physical, I mean like properties of motion. And this is big in Aristotelianism. Aristotle thinks that physics and metaphysics are deeply connected to each other. And so Hobbes, although he starts his uh, philosophical study into like physics and motion, he really gets interested into human motion, how humans come mm-hmm. to be. So I think that's pretty cool. Do we want to keep going on a background of the other three or kind of work into uh, their ideas now? Um, I think let's work into Hobbes and then we can kind of touch on relevant historical details as we go. Sure. Okay, so Hobbes' biggest piece of work is the Leviathan, mm-hmm. which is a reference to some sea monster uh, in the book of Job. And this is a, a crazy, crazy book. Mm-hmm. What do y'all know about the Leviathan before we get started? Um, I think it is important to note that the Leviathan was published two years after Charles I was executed and Oliver Cromwell takes over and institutes a republic. So England is in this like big period of civil strife po- yeah. and like all of this regime change is happening as he's writing. So it does make sense that he's so... Um, concerned about fear and like stability in society or that human nature is this like vile thing that needs to be controlled by a strong government. Yeah. Yeah. Can I add a little historical context to that? Please. That's the thing I know in this episode. (laughs) Yeah. That's the English civil war Mm -hmm. we're talking about. Yeah. You're right. Oliver Cromwell established the Puritan Republic, you know, so there was a Republic before the United States came along. Yeah. It was the execute, like guys, they executed the Mm -hmm. King. That's big time. Yeah. That hasn't happened before. And it was chaos. You see the 25 or so year reign of, of James the first, mm-hmm. where you have these rival factions within parliament driven by extremist Puritans, for lack of a better term. Yeah. It seemed like everything they had known was really just kind of falling apart. And then, of course, you execute the king. And guys, the, the 11 year reign of Oliver, Oliver Cromwell was ruthless. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, just, you know, ask the Irish. Jeez. <laughs> so quite frankly, after those 11 years, the English were quite happy to uh to to 
I'm sorry, I said execution of James, James the first, Charles, Charles the first, who was executed. Yep. Very sorry. So with the restoration, they invited Charles II to, uh, to mm-hmm. after 11 years of Oliver Cromwell, to come back and reestablish uh, the monarchy yeah. and, the, and, and the parliament. So yeah, this, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Yep. And that's something yeah. like a central that we'll, we'll get out of the Leviathan. He's not, he's not a pro-democracy guy. Um, he's, he's in favor of a sovereign, uh, mm-hmm. which is something that I kind of like mm-hmm. about him. Yeah. Well, the Leviathan starts, it's not, doesn't start necessarily as a political treatise. It starts off with what human beings are fundamentally. Mm -hmm. And he starts from this concept that he's really spent a lot of time on in physics. He thinks that human beings, how they are naturally, they don't have an innate soul. Human beings are just bodies that are, he's a materialist. He thinks human beings are just their physical bodies. But these physical bodies are things that are designed. I mean, they're so complex, and this is something we know now. They're so complex and that they were created by a God, but they don't have a soul. Um, we just are our bodies. Right. So created by God, but we are but a materialistic sort yep. of viewpoint. We are we our are bodies. Our bodies. We have no yeah. soul. Not a ma- yeah. We don't have an immaterial soul. And so right. this is this is definitely something in the backdrop uh, of him. Uh, if we don't have a soul, then Maybe there's a lack of some human mm-hmm. dignity, but that's a topic for another day. Mm-hmm. He, he moves on and he talks about what's the, what is a good that humans share? Well, humans have a lot of different desires. They differ drastically from person to person. So is there one greatest good? Probably not. And the fact that there's not one greatest good for us, mm-hmm. that causes us a lot of struggle and tension. And this makes a lot of sense to me. Like if we go to different cultures and communities around the mm-hmm. world, what they value most is completely different from each other in a lot of ways. However, um, Hobbes, although there's not mm-hmm. one single greatest good that people have, he does recognize that humans have a single shared worst evil that can occur to them. And that is a violent death getting mm. torn apart. And mm-hmm. so this is what he believes a political community yeah. needs to be built around. Not a shared good, but a shared fear of evil, Mm -hmm. primarily death. This is brutal. I mean, this is really, really brutal. What do y'all think Mm -hmm. about this? Do you think this is true? Well, I'll pass it on to Taylor to whether or not it's true. Mm -hmm. I think it's a reflection of, frankly, all the violence that came with the English Civil War and why I'm so concerned about that. But anyway, what do you think, Taylor? I think it makes sense given the context. Do I agree? Not fully, because... I think he's very pessimistic, understandably so, but I think that society can also be built around the pursuit of a human good and like human flourishing rather than defeating evil or like a shared fear. I don't know. I get where he's coming from, but I don't necessarily agree. Well, we can talk about this later. I think that's probably true. I think he's probably right. Because I don't, I I mean, even within two people, I don't think we mm-hmm. could, all three of us could agree on a human good. Mm-hmm. And if we want to talk about what flourishing is, I think we'd all have different understandings of it. But this idea of a shared evil in no good, mm-hmm. no shared good, this is a concept for him that's very important called the state of nature. This is how people are born. Mm-hmm. This is just how the world would be without any form of society. People apart mm-hmm. from society, it's a crazy, chaotic, anarchic world in which humans are constantly competing yeah. uh, against each other for their own goods. And so in this kind of state mm-hmm. of nature, that's what it's called, what we're naturally born into without a society, uh, security, um, safety, culture, cooperation, these are not things that exist. And so he gives this whole outline mm-hmm. about how um, societies originally form, about uh, how people see that if they band together, they can put off probably a violent death because there's more of them working together and achieve some similar goods that they share. And his main Mm -hmm. political motivation is to escape that crazy state of nature. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. um, And what he does is he gives two laws of nature, which are rational Mm -hmm. principles to guide human behavior inside kind of a society. These main two, I don't know if you want, I'll say these two and then we can just talk about that. Uh, these main two, first, are to seek peace, 
seeking peace is probably the biggest good for people because that will allow us to uh, not violently die if we don't seek for peace. Mm -hmm. That will encourage violent death and uh, failure of society. And the second, and this is the most important one, or the one that's probably the most influential to political philosophy, is that people should be willing to give up their rights, not all of them, but some of them, Mm -hmm. in order and others do the same in order to build a safer society. This allows for, yeah. is for a formation of society itself or a commonwealth. Mm-hmm. So, and this makes sense. I mean, just think about in our own lives, you can't go down the street, you know, on a highway and take a dump in the middle of a road or something. This would be ultimate freedom that we <laughs> naturally have in Hobbes U. We naturally have freedom, but that causes a lot of on safety, and it's kind of um, crazy. And so Mm -hmm. uh, Hobbes believes that we need to give up rights in order to live in a society that prevents us from bad death, basically. What do y'all think? Yeah. Is this the first instance of social contract theory in Western philosophy? I'm not Mm -hmm. not sure if it's the first. I'm not sure. Yeah, Yeah, I'm I'm not not sure. sure. Well, it's what I identify with today as like modern social contract theory. Mm -hmm. I don't know if modern, but well, modern in terms of the modern era. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Well, Andrew, we got to You got to roll out that famous quote, though, of how life is under the uh, under the state of nature. Uh, Taylor. Solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Great quote. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what? Yeah. And that's why we need. We got to escape that, mm-hmm. right? And that, yeah. that's the whole social contract. Yeah. yeah. And he also goes on to say that the state of nature is basically a war of all against all. And I think that's mm-hmm. pretty essential into looking into how violent he thinks that nature really is, that we're all constantly feuding with each other. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's just saying something about something about the world. We'll talk about this later. Let's move on to, mm-hmm. let's move on to law. I have a little bit on Locke um, from his second treatise on government. Okay. And I think the biggest takeaways from Locke are that he stresses natural rights, which he'll differentiate from political rights. And we can talk about that. Um, Limited government, that the government, unlike how Hobbes proposes like this all-powerful leviathan, Locke thinks that the government's power has limitations um, based on like the people and Locke stresses popular sovereignty. So you get like an opposite resolution to the conflict in the state of nature Hmm. because Locke will also talk about how maybe the state of nature isn't quite as violent as Hobbes makes it out to be, but it still is conflicting and without a social contract in place, people can't really live in peace in harmony. They need rules and they need to give up some of their freedom, but they should still retain like the ability to vote and make decisions. Hmm. So for some context, Locke was affiliated with Lord Ashley and the Whig party. He was kind of more involved in politics. He was also English. And during the English Civil War, he Mm -hmm. fled England and then later returned. Two of his other big works are the essay concerning human understanding and the letter concerning toleration. So Locke from the beginning was a lot more involved in politics and like kind of set out to write political philosophy and come to like a political solution rather than exploring something else and kind of stumbling upon political philosophy. Yeah. He wrote two treatises on government and his ideas were really important to the American founding with someone like Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence, you see almost word for word things from Locke's treatises. Oh, yeah. You read the Declaration of Independence just just dripping with uh, Enlightenment language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big time. The the only thing I can probably add to this philosophically from from Locke, what little I have, as far as the state of nature is just in comparison with Hobbes, it was just his view of humanity in the state of nature was just far more positive. Mm -hmm. But that people were essentially rational yeah. and had some sort of moral conscience, right, to guide their behavior mm-hmm. uh, rather than this chaotic, anarchic uh, sort of Hobbesian view of humanity. I just have two things to add, uh, and they both, again, kind of come from the moral psychology side of things. But I think his understanding of 
human psychology at least or yeah human psychology and how we come to have an identity impacts his um political philosophy he has a mm-hmm. famous yeah, definitely. essay called the essay concerning human understanding mm-hmm. and in mm-hmm. this he puts forth this ideal idea that goes all the way back from Aristotle and goes through a bunch of Islamic philosophers and uh, Aristotle, but he is the one who uh, steals this idea. Kidding. But um, <laughs> this is, I think, mostly associated with him called an idea of humans as being a tabula rasa. Mm-hmm. At the time mm-hmm. of birth, human beings are, the mind uh, is a blank slate and they don't have any natural predispositions or internal biases other than Mm -hmm. really the ability to process what's around them and that what Mm -hmm. what happens over time is that when we process things around us how our parents treat us how other kids at school treat us you know things like this that's how we are able to make these biases and how how we can come to understand the world Mm -hmm. and in this idea i mean it's kind of interesting that if we think that we're born without anything, like any any rules or anything, that means that the take is that human beings have a natural freedom to them. That human beings, mm-hmm. and this is like straight from the Declaration of Independence, uh, human beings are free to write the content of their character. That they are uh, they are the ones who they have a natural natural freedom. Uh, that will allow them to be whatever they want, do whatever they want, as long as they haven't, as long as they've processed the world around them in a good way and they've had a fine upbringing, then that, that's a natural freedom. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's pretty cool. And I think that leads into his idea of natural rights. Yeah. Do we want to talk a little bit about natural li- rights versus political rights? Sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. Locke defines natural rights as a claim individuals can make about dessert based on what is natural. So these are things that are given to us based on our nature as human beings, and they're recognized by the regime, but they're not given by the regime. So think about things like liberty, life, and property to Locke is really important. Not the pursuit of happiness, but the acquisition of property And he talks about that and qualifies that putting your labor into something is really important for your claim to property. So say there's an apple tree that's held in common by everyone in a group or a family. If you go pick the apple, the apple is by nature yours because your labor was used to pick it. And like if you cultivate an orchard of apple trees... Because you put your labor into them, you have a natural right to those. Mm -hmm. And he contrasts that with political rights, which are a claim about dessert based on the constitution of a regime upon the government. So the government or the regime gives you these rights and they're made by citizens and they're not necessarily granted by your natural abilities. So things like voting, that'd be a political right. You don't have an inherent natural right based on your rationality to be able to vote, but the regime grants that to you. Yeah, and I think that this is just a, what is it, second treatise on civil government. This is, a, I mean, a big point that the difference between these two comes down to what he thinks is is different between, what is it, civil, okay. He thinks that there's like a natural, natural state of people. Mm-hmm. And that natural state of nature, state of nature, not natural state of nature, that state of nature mm-hmm. is inherently at odds uh, with the civil society. And civil society comes yeah. in to give us some protection and things of this sort. And that has natural obligations and things in it. Mm-hmm. In, the, in a state of nature, humans, all humans... Let me find the quote real quick, if I can find it in my notes. And this is how he gets to life, liberty, and property, which is why I want to mention it. But he says that all men Mm -hmm. are free to order their actions and dispose of their possessions in persons as they think fit Mm -hmm. within the bounds of the law of nature. Yeah. This apple tree example that you give, I mean, that's, that's the perfect example of that. And something, too, that naturally comes from that, which he recognizes, is that there's a natural, if there's a state of nature, there's a natural law of nature. Mm-hmm. And that law of nature, mm-hmm. I mean, and this is big, 
that we this isn't more important than we can talk about just for today. But believing that there's a law of nature uh, is something we might or may or may not believe today. But this underscores uh, a lot of constitutions around the world that there's an, a law mm-hmm. of nature, and what regulates that law of nature is reason, and reason mm-hmm. is what mm-hmm. teaches us to believe that not just life, liberty, and property, and that's just out there, but that no one ought to harm another's life, liberty, and property. And it's by reason and this law of nature that we don't infringe on these aspects of other people. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just very interesting and, and very cool. And Locke also talks about how the state of nature can quickly devolve into a state of war when people are ignorant of the natural law. Yep. And they infringe on other people's rights to their life or their liberty or their property. And that's why we need a civil government. So people enter into a social contract so that their life and all of their properties can be protected. And that's similar in a way to Hobbes with the idea that the state of nature is inherently unstable, that we can't fully enjoy either our natural rights or... um, our life at a very basic level, like you don't have security in your own existence without developing some system of rules to govern people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's where we get to all this business with um, with Locke, which will sound very familiar for constitutions that we, that you guys have mentioned before. That in order now, you know that that that's the case, we need something to protect that. And that's where we, we end up with the idea that, that governments are established or derive their legitimacy, uh, not from some divine mm-hmm. providence, uh, but rather from the consent of the governed to protect uh, that society that they have created. So that's where you get a bit of that social contract theory in there. So, so again, opposite to Hobbes, he, yeah. he, he did not see the need for an absolute authoritarian type mm-hmm. of government, but rather... This idea, again, it's very much American, is that idea for for a limited government with uh, checks and balances and individual rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish that we could. I mean, I'll be more qualified uh, in future future years, but who really influences all of the specific nature and buildup of constitutional principles is Montesquieu uh, and the spirit Mm -hmm. of the laws. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful book. Uh, that is a th- oh, that's a wonderful yeah <laughs> that's 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 an amazing amazing book oh no, that's great so in college I took a uh, a French Revolution course oh. and uh, and and we had to choose a book from a French writer at that point you know so whether it's Voltaire or Montesquieu or whatever I, I was I was clueless so I chose Montesquieu in Spirit of the Laws. That thing's a book stop, a doorstop, man. That thing's like, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. <laughs> it's like 800, 1,000 yeah, pages. It's or very something. big. But uh, yes, that is where the idea of like three branches of government mm-hmm. and checks and balances and all that stuff comes from. Yeah, it comes from Montesquieu, built kind of on top of, of Locke's ideas. Mm-hmm. It's all connected. Yeah, it's an, it's an amazing, very influential book. And uh, I can't, well, I, yeah. I, I won't say more about that because that's not what we're talking about today. But maybe we'll talk about him in the future. Yeah, because I don't really know much about Montesquieu other than like kind of his namesake. Haven't really gotten to study him much. He's cool. Oh, you know, if I'm to be totally honest, too, I can't say that you know, thirty something years ago when I read Spirit of the Laws that I really read all mm. of Spirit of the Laws. Don't tell my professor; I'm gonna take my degree away. <laughs> um. <laughs> But hey, there was no spark notes back then. Ooh, good old spark notes. Oof. I know. <laughs> rough, rough. No, I, I had um, to read that for a class and it was, I mean, not all of it, but the first probably, I don't know, half. And I, I really liked it other than having to like, uh, you know, read it. But I thought it was very, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to Rousseau, okay. my least favorite. Ah. Is it because he's French? No, but that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, I forget. You like the French. You're all about Napoleon. I like you know, Napoleon. without Rousseau, you'd never get Napoleon, you know. Uh, Napoleon has come up in my classes a couple times in recent weeks. I've meant to to let you know, Andrew, <laughs> when it arose, it's but I didn't. It's just because the movie's coming out. Everyone's a bandwagon. Uh 
<laughs> no. Well, my classes are like modern history era. So it's like relevant to the class. Oh, I see. You, you, you just yeah. read that biography like two months ago. I mean, you know, were you a Napoleon stand before then yourself? No, did I tell you all about how that happened? I don't know if this is a good story. My friend. I don't know. Oh, that's a good story. I'm sure it's my a good friend's story. friend. So my college roommate, or not, well, one of my college roommates, he went to Rutgers and then transferred to Rice. His Rutgers roommate, he's a he actually studied philosophy. Well, he's interested. He's interested. In, he's getting his PhD in theoretical physics right now. Wow. At Notre Dame, but he loves philosophy. So wow. so I met him virtually because of that, and he loves Napoleon. And so when I saw this Napoleon movie was coming out, I texted him. I've never met the guy and uh, asked him for some recommendations. And he gave me a lot of recommendations, but said to start with the Andrew Roberts Napoleon. And it was a fantastic read. Maybe I'll gift you all copies for for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Is, would you say Napoleon is your Roman Empire? No, no. My Roman Empire is my Roman Empire so much that I got a degree in it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. That's right. Classical studies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. Oh. What's my Roman Empire? What's your Roman Empire, Taylor? We'll just go around the table. Oh, probably women in philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, yeah, yeah, I probably think about that as much as the boys think about the Roman empire as if they claim yeah. every single day. I don't think most guys yeah, do. That was, a fun, that was a funny TikTok no. trend. I would agree. Probably with not. That. <laughs> well, you know, we all think about Rome in different ways. Uh, you know, this will sound elitist. <laughs> so I'm not going to say it, but you know, not all of us will think about the Roman empire in the same way. So when I think oh. about the Roman empire, you know, I think about a, a philosophical tradition. Mm hmm. You know, and uh, and the and the government, yeah. yeah, a little bit of war, I guess. But uh, I, you know, my my uh, Roman Empire is probably Greece, yeah. ancient Greece. That's so real. Um, you know, I know, I know more about ancient Greece than mm -hmm. I do Rome. I know a lot about Rome, but ancient Greece is my wheelhouse. So yeah. Anyway, I know a lot more right. about Greece than I know about Rome too. Well, now we all know what our Roman empires are. I think I actually <laughs> think about Rome, maybe not every day, but maybe every other day. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think about Greece or Rome every day, one probably, or the other. Yeah, I probably think about Greece I, almost every day. I think about one or the yeah, other but, probably every every day for sure. Yeah, but that's yeah. because all three of us are in right. philosophy. Like, I'm, like, yeah, I'm also in a classic you know, philosophy class, so I'm like... That would uh, make I, Well, yeah, okay, that's a given. Yeah. And like, it's the like my job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I literally think about Plato every single day, multiple times a day. Oh, good old yeah. Plato. Ah, good dude. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay. Rousseau. Who are we doing? Rousseau, Rousseau, Rousseau. Oh, uh -huh. is he a great Frenchman? Yeah, oui. he's French. He's French. Oui. Rousse Rousseau, I think. <laughs> Rousseau, Rousseau. He is a. I think he really uh, is an interesting guy for me because of how he thinks about mm -hmm. humans. Uh, but I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't know too much about him other than I don't know too much about his impact on political philosophy other than how he impacts the American Revolution. Uh, so I can speed run this so we can talk more about his political ideas. And I don't have as much. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. We know the most about Rousseau because he has a, his own autobiography. And his own autobiography is a copy of Augustine's Confessions. Uh, it's, mm. it's Rousseau's mm. Confessions and this is about his life, and it's it's decidedly similar to um, uh, to Augustine. Augustine's biography also gives us an account of his view of <laughs> of human nature. Uh, hum Augustine believes that humans are wicked mm -hmm. at the time they're born, and that they're saved through baptism. Yeah. Rousseau believes in an opposite. He believes that humans are basically good at birth and are later corrupted by society. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so yeah. he gives this story at the beginning of his confessions about a time when he steals asparagus. 
Uh, and this is <laughs> <laughs> wait. I don't know why that's so explain, funny. I always think of Augustine. Yeah, explain, explain why you're laughing though about Augustine, <laughs> just so we have some context. Oh, yeah, I yeah, think it's book three, maybe in in the Confessions. He tells a story from his teenage years where he was a a, a naughty boy, uh, and he carries on for pages about this time oh that he gosh, stole yeah. some fruit. I don't know if it's an apple, but some fruit from from an orchard, uh, and he just like the guilt over well, this is just tremendous. Why does it, well, do you remember uh, why he says that he stole the pears? That's the important part. No, no, because I can't they recall. could. Yeah, they literally had nothing better to do yes. than steal these pears, uh, yes. and they, he said like. They weren't good. They stole so many yep. of them. They never could have eaten them all. Yep. And they were just like <laughs> literally being teenage boys and doing ridiculous things. And then they ended up like just yep. trashing a bunch of them. Yep. And he's like, that was yeah. literally so evil and so ridiculous of me to ever do. I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Like I'm such a vile yeah, this, creature. Cause yeah, I this is the things. argument you know, that, that people have these days of, especially like public school where we have to keep the kids busy. Otherwise, you know, if they have nothing better to do, they'll go steal apples. But I don't know why, I whatever, like true. stealing asparagus, just, that just cracked me up. I'm sorry. No, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's decided of all the things to steal. It's decidedly similar. <laughs> it's this, it's intentionally similar. Yeah. Uh, and so he, well, his, sure, sure, his sure. point is that, uh, he is he his friend gets him to steal some asparagus but uh his point is not that he, <laughs> just <kidding. laughs> it's not that he was like right up, like up there stealing brussels sprouts okay i'm sorry Go on. <laughs> asparagus i mean that's so funny it's so french but uh you know <laughs> <laughs> you're making it worse Stop making me okay laugh. talk about the- it's not it's so, not yeah, that uh funny. it's not <laughs> It's not that uh, it's not that he was he's mad about it. The point is that his like his friend made him do it, and so it's society that's corrupting him into committing these bad acts. It's not that it's it's the corrupt corruptedness of human society that leads someone to do something bad, and that's what that's what corrupts them. It's not some mm-hmm. bad natural badness of human nature. In fact, I think Rousseau. Uh, aligns himself pretty closely to Locke and thinks that humans by nature are a blank slate. And, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. so, and so, um, and so that's pretty interesting, I think. Yeah. Rousseau has that iconic quote, man is free or man is born free and everywhere he is in chains that society conditions us into being not free based on all the rules where our nature is one of like complete freedom that we're able to do and think all of these things. But then because we're born into a society that's unjust and grates against our natural being, Andrew's shaking his head. <laughs> Explain, yeah, yeah, Andrew. Yeah. No, uh, that's a great line. And I want to say, I could be wrong. I think that's the opening line to his book, mm-hmm. um, which is just a killer Something great like first that. line. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just so Andrew. trendy. It's like, what are we listening uh, to? What that, what that society corrupts yeah, us? It's like, what are we listening to? Taylor Swift? <laughs> Andrew, I knew what? you were going to say I that. Talk about to I knew it. <laughs> it's just so basic. And it's like, it's like, okay. Wait, so you, so you don't think society corrupts us? No, I think we're bad by nature. What? I think we're bad by nature. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I think we're bad by nature. So, okay, wait, wait, wait. Time Wait. Out. You're saying society has no influence on our behavior negatively. Um, well, I think that society is pretty bad, but I think that's not because society corrupts us. I don't, where would that corruption start? If everyone is just like, it's, it's a, it's, it's like a infinite regression. Where would that corruption? Oh, I see start? what you're saying. Okay, okay, so that it has to have some origin. Yeah, and so that would be humans. Like, is it some like alien brings? Okay, I don't know. And then so it's like, okay, society can corrupt us and make us bad. Like, but even Augustine thinks that. Like, Augustine thinks when he right. goes and he watches like the fights in the stadium, like that's society doing bad mm-hmm. things, and he's enraptured by it and loves it. But I think that it's just mm-hmm. like I think I think like humans just like little kids they're they're like very cute but they want what's best for themselves <laughs> they, they do some naughty yeah. things mm. yeah. and it's 
Uh, no, I, okay. So, so I get what you're saying. I, I really, I yeah. do. Um, so you're saying like yeah. this, this corruption that that society embodies or is uh, must have some origin yeah. point. Uh, it's not that society in and of itself, which doesn't exist without human beings creating it. That mm-hmm. uh, that, that there must be some origin, and that origin is the just the corrupt nature of humans to begin with. Yeah, and even if you're not a, a religious person who believes in like original sin or a Christian or whatever, I mean, this makes sense to me just from a sense of like evolutionary thinking. I think that all all mm-hmm. things probably mm-hmm. look out from their own nature, and so mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. just like very natural, I think. And it's also so- yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, I was, I was going to suggest one more thing about your yeah, yeah, example yeah. with children. Yes. I mean, wouldn't you say, uh, could, could it be said that human beings change so much from the time that they're infants Definitely. to like a, an adult with, with you know, full capacity to reason cognitively and all that sort of stuff. And you're right. Like kids are a, are a very raw version of what humans are like, but they're a raw version of what humans are like at the age of two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I don't know. It's interesting yeah. to think about. I don't know how far that like extends um, to say that we can blame all of, you know, human nature that we're corrupt, you know, based on observation of small children. Oh, I mean, like, or, yeah. like even teenage kids, too. And even like looking at, uh, at at normal people in the world. But that's that's I think, though, the the point that you made is actually a really good point against uh, Rousseau. Um, Rousseau idolizes the child. Rousseau mm. idolizes the that's child true. as being the one thing that's free in the world, the one thing that's not corrupted. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, well, it's also a baby. And then we're just discounting wisdom. Like in the West, yeah. I think, and really all cultures in the world that I can think of, what we idolize, maybe not today, actually, in the West, like younger kids, we think boomers are bad and kind of stupid. <laughs> Next. But that's that's kind of silly and we made it (laughs) (laughs) sorry (laughs) and and it's like okay i think uh that just kind of goes against um a lot of cultural beliefs like when we we Mm -hmm. i think we often don't idolize the infant because they don't know anything but we idolize the elder who Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but let me let me throw this cool charles taylor quote out charles taylor is a sociologist and philosopher who's pretty famous uh and he says in uh, uh contemporary yeah, I believe he's still yeah, alive right yeah. he's old he's but uh, mm-hmm. he's still alive uh, you can buy his the secular age on on audiobook for for like on audible and it's like a 66 hour book of philosophy <laughs> oh my god wow that's, a long <laughs> that's right andrew's all about the audiobooks right now <laughs> it's so silly but he says in talking six, about Rousseau, six, yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's probably as long as the spirit of the laws. But uh, he says the original impulse of nature is right, but the effect of a depraved culture is that we lose contact with it. Mm. We lose contact, mm. that being with our original nature. Uh, and that's him yeah. not endorsing mm. this view, but summing up Rousseau. Yeah, um, I'm pulling on just really old history lessons here in my head, but... <laughs> So Rousseau, you know, one of his one of his big talking points was, uh, and this all deals with social contract theory, is that it's just slightly different take. It's like, okay, we're good when we're born, but then so society corrupts us, mm-hmm. and so what we want is a return to nature, right? Yep. yep. And that was a lot of that was based on like there was some idolization of Native Americans. Um, during this time, yep. mm-hmm. uh, that they were an example yep. of what man was like in the state of nature. And it was much simpler. Yep. And although there was warfare, you know, it, it seemed like just so far simpler than, say, the, you know, if you're talking about London or Paris yep. at this time, yep. I mean, you would think society is definitely corrupt. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, we want this return to nature, but we can't return we to can't. nature, you know, right. as Hobbes' point, even though we want it. And that's where government needs to step mm-hmm. in. Um, and yeah. you know, so mm-hmm. yep. yeah, and he talks about how the purpose of the state is the common good. That yep. this is pretty similar to Locke, that the state should serve the public interest. Where Rousseau kind of draws a line is that Locke, in a lot of ways, when he talks about popular sovereignty, it's just what the majority wants. Well, mm-hmm. if you have you know a 51% majority, say a simple majority. That's still 49% of people that aren't getting represented. Yep. So mm. Rousseau talks about the general will, which 
is kind mm-hmm. of a difficult mm-hmm. concept to like parse out. Yep. But it's like if you drew a Venn diagram with as many circles as you want to draw, it'd be the overlap of all of those circles is the general mm-hmm. will. The thing that everybody in society can agree on is a good for human nature and for the function of society. And I think that that's a good way to go about it, at least in terms of like the idea that minority groups or like the people, like the factions that are not in power shouldn't be counted out just because the majority votes for something. It doesn't mean it's necessarily good or like the best thing to pursue. That's really interesting. I always do wonder... (laughs) You know, I remember, oh gosh, am I right here? When George W. Bush Jr. was was elected for the second term, he said something like, I have a mandate from the people. Mm. And I'm like, well, not all the people. And, yeah. you know, I think, you know, in our institutions, you know, in America, roughly, it's usually majority rule. Um, so if it's like, you know, 50.5, you know, versus 49.5, right. uh, it's like, wow, like there's a whole lot of people Mm-hmm. Like hundreds of millions that didn't get their particular view, you know, which has been mm-hmm. every political um, election in the United States since 1989. Yeah, mm-hmm. seriously, yeah. it's been very divided. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I, I always think of that about that when I, you know, when when politicians will come along and they're like, mm-hmm. "I received a mandate from the people." I'm like, "No, <laughs> you received a mandate from like a 51.8 yeah. percent." Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and I feel anyway. like now it's more and more like people will settle for an option of like, well, this candidate expresses my views more closely, but I think I'm seeing at least that more and more people are like, I don't like either person running. And like, I don't quite approve of most of the things they say, but this is my political party. So I'm going to vote down this line or like, they express my view on this issue or enough issues to get my vote or people just don't vote at all because they're like, well, they're both bad. So why would my vote matter? All right. This is Parsons endorsement that everyone should vote. Mm -hmm. So, so what, so let's like apply Taylor, apply uh, Russo's idea of like the general will to, to what we've been talking about. Um, yeah. In terms of like how he believes government should function. Yeah, I mean, like we've been talking about this, you know, yeah. fifty-one versus forty-nine business. Like, is, yeah, is that think, addressed by his general will? Um, I think in a lot of ways it is that the aggregate of all wills should be expressed rather than just like what mm-hmm. the most amount of people say, because it keeps the government in line. Right. That like if the government okay. is designed to express the aggregate of all wills, what all people agree on, then it kind of checks their power. And limits the government, similar to how Locke talks about, um, like the government needs to be limited, which kind Mm -hmm. of both of them oppose Hobbes and that the government shouldn't just have all of this authoritative power. I'm curious. Yeah, let's I'm curious in your interest, Taylor. Mm -hmm. So I think my interest is on the like how they see the I mean, we said this already, how they see like the human self. And, mm-hmm. and then they build that all the way up to people or to society and how a government should be. So we looked at Hobbes first, who had his very like chaotic mm-hmm. and free view of people. And then they came together to form a society to protect each other. Locke thought that the people naturally at birth know nothing and society can condition them, but they have reason and that will allow them to not infringe on other people's. And then uh, Rousseau thinks society is naturally oppressive and that the government needs to step in and kind of help regulate. But how, how do you like mm-hmm. to think about philosophy's impact on not only like idealized government in, in, this, in these cases, but where we see a clear case that philosophy influences real government, at least in like the United States, how the U.S government was formed off of a lot of these political thoughts like how do you see that connection there between philosophy and in real life politics Mm -hmm. i think what interests me in thinking about political philosophy is like regime structure at least right now where i'm like more focused on studying kind of the political side of it how 
regimes function and what the different parts of a regime, like the government and what the state does and all these different facets of a country, how they work together and how that means that states interact with each other. But I also also think it's interesting to see how these writings are expressed in things like the Constitution. So I, I think I'm more like the historical through line I see. of philosophy. So you see Hobbes start writing and that creates like murmurs in the public and it starts shifting how people think about their regime and then how they relate to it. So they're aware that maybe this government is not the best government we have, so we should think up a new one. And then you see it kind of twist again as you get to Locke and then you get to Rousseau and things are kind of being refined in a way. And then it sends out these ripples into like actual political society where people in America are like, well, we're having this problem with our liberty and now we have some sort of philosophical justification for the actions that we want to take. So they start acting and then you see even more like a domino effect after that of other countries see, well, this colony gained their independence based on this philosophy. So we can too. I think that's more of my interest, how at least in this case, political philosophy impacts regimes and like international relations. Hmm. I have one last question for you because I know we're almost out of time. I guess for both of you, there is a clear connection between Western democracies. I mean, this is a big question, but there's a clear Mm -hmm. connection between Western uh, democracies and uh, the cultural philosophy that influences them. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is like Hobbes, he's a philosopher, Rousseau is a, mm-hmm. you know, and so that's all our, our culture. But I, I'm kind of, um, I'm interested to, to see in the future, the exportation of democracy across the world has, mm-hmm. I think it's failed, probably like, like in the yes. 1960s, there's a big movement in Africa to uh, mm-hmm. I- implement democracies by their strongman leaders at the time. And now it looks like that's mm-hmm. failed. Obviously, uh, in China and India, it's not looking too hot. Uh, and so I'm yeah. curious if there's some, like, the reason that they didn't work is that there's some cultural disconnect with the philosophy there. We've actually um, recently talked about that in my comparative government class. Hmm. We're talking about, we just talked about democracies, and now we're talking about authoritarian regimes. And political scientists are seeing this wave of democratic backslide mm-hmm. where the government's that were formed, a lot of them after the Cold War in the early 90s, are starting to collapse. And Mm. one traditional lens that people view that through is culturalist. Does the culture and their cultural values really support democratic values? Does the culture value honor? Is it a like an honor-based culture if you think like ancient Greece and Sparta, Mm -hmm. um, which Mm -hmm. may not necessarily be compatible with democracy if their style of conflict resolution is more violent. Um, And like, what does that mean? Or was it the institutions that made it fail? And I think that's an interesting way to come about it of like, how do these philosophical ideas fit into Mm -hmm. how we're analyzing things politically? And like, where do we see that? I don't know, move together. Mr. Parsons, what do you think? Yeah, gosh, I have a lot to think of, uh, say about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in Eastern Europe and in Italy too, we're seeing the rise of authoritarianism mm-hmm. uh, or authoritarian leadership. But, you know, there's pushback against it too. Just last week, Poland elected a, a centrist yeah. government when it looked like they were going mm-hmm. to go hard right. So, uh, so, so, you know, there's some back and forthing there. Uh, same with in France. Some of the examples that Andrew brought up, you know, so for instance, 1960s in Africa. Yeah, that was set up for failure. Uh, Not because of the people and their culture. It's that like European countries that administrated over those, uh, over those countries in Africa for a couple centuries. And then all of a sudden, 1960s, it just became really popular to, uh, you know, uh, give those countries their freedom back. And they Mm -hmm. had no experience, no experience Mm -hmm. with a representative democracy. So that was that was set up to fail from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, India's different too, although certainly imperialism, British imperialism, mm-hmm. was a big part of, of India's history as well. 
and then you see a split between um, between the Indians and Pakistan, yeah. although that was, a lot of that was religious. And then the China, good grief, China's such a wacky story. Yeah. Just all their dynasties and how it all fell apart and then how communism came into it and then how mm -hmm. they've tried to have like a communistic government but a capitalistic economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so those those are kind of some very brief thoughts on on mm -hmm. on Andrew's the three areas he brought up. Yep. It is an interesting question though, you know, is democracy something and you know, is democracy something that can work everywhere? But also, you know, I think we have some questions or issues about what we mean when we say democracy. Oh yeah. Um, or Political what we mean when we say can't agree. Yeah. Yeah, republicanism or something mm -hmm. like that. People think like America is a democracy. We're certainly not a direct democracy. Right. Um, we're a republican democracy. But then even, you know, so yeah, it's more nuanced than like democracy doesn't work in certain places because yeah. there's so many flavors of democracy, uh -huh. if you will. Yeah, and so many reasons that it could potentially not work. But then you see like Japan, when the U.S. was very mm. involved in democratizing japan and it has been successful so it's not that yeah. in all cases it will fail just sometimes but yeah yeah i meant to bring up japan mm -hmm. uh, talk about a culture based on honor right. and uh yeah. and democracy has been uh incredibly successful there at post-world war ii mm. and i'm wondering if uh if there's almost um an un this is going to be controversial, so I'm trying to think about how to how to say this. If there's a overhyped love for democracy, mm. yeah, I that's definitely a question to be explored. I think that'd be interesting to talk about, like in the future, maybe on an episode. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think that uh, yeah. there might be some. I mean, the fact that uh, authoritarian countries they just move a whole lot quicker than democracies. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because democracy true. is designed to be true. slow. Yep. yep. Right. Especially like American yeah. democracy, it's designed to work slowly to prevent power growths. Yeah, exactly yeah. what authoritarian yeah. countries have, and uh, right. And there's almost there's a hard line now. The only, well, I don't know. It's a it's a topic for another day, and probably mm -hmm. another podcast. <laughs> another. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. They can move fast. Mm -hmm. There's certainly a lot of uh, other negatives that come along with authoritarian states as far as quality of life for other citizens. Mm -hmm. Venezuela is a good example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let's wrap it up. I'll just say thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode, Political Philosophy. We've not done political mm -hmm. philosophy. I mean, we've, our podcast is, is almost three years, and uh, we've not done political philosophy once. Ooh, I think we've covered I think. every single thing. Other yeah. philosophy. Intentionally yeah. so. so this is great. Yeah. And I think our next episode, guys, uh, is more political philosophy, mm -hmm. if I recall. Modern. Yeah. About people that I yeah. truly know nothing about. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, guys, thanks for listening. It was great. Yeah. It was yeah. And if you enjoyed the episode or have any thoughts that you would like to convey to us, please, please let us know either at our email at contact at opendoorphilosophy.com or over on Instagram, shoot us a DM and we'll get back to you. And don't forget, if you want to see the video version of this podcast, check out our YouTube channel. Andrew is hard at work getting everything uploaded there. So yeah. Yeah. I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best. <laughs> uh, anyways, this was fun. Uh, so mm -hmm. remember, if you want to check us out anywhere, that's great. Leave us a review too on Apple. We never mm -hmm. say, I, we, we haven't said that like, I think last week. Yeah, so bad at years. It. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. lost the habit. Rate us mm -hmm. um, and hit the likes and stuff on YouTube because that's fun to see. And send us emails and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's fun. Uh, if you want to, yeah. you have freedom. And yeah. so remember, if your life's in need of some philosophy, the door is always open. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys. Bye.